Thelma Varadis. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. It's always a pleasure to visit this nice institute. I'm, but I have to apologize, as usual, because these slides are really terribly, terribly prepared. So, um, unless you ask some questions along the way, I don't think it will make much sense. So I'll do the best I can. But I, I, I think the excuse is something like this. So I'm spending this semester in Korea and finding out that I'm not really Korean anymore. Uh, everybody moves so fast, I can't keep up with anything. So I've fallen behind on everything, so I couldn't prepare this lecture either. So <laughs> anyways, you have to help me along. That's all with the energy of, of the city, so to speak. Uh, anyways, so, oops. Yes. This doesn't. So I can't even operate this. Okay, so we'll move on then to the first disorganized slide. Uh, so I'll just set up a little bit of notation. <laughs> so uh, F will be some number field, and I'll fix a finite set of primes, S, inside the field, and R will denote the ring of S integers. So we're allowing denominators from S. And P is some odd prime, not divisible by the primes that we're fixing. And V will be a place of P uh, lying above, no, sorry, of F lying above P, except it's actually important here for that place to be a uh, split. So it shouldn't, it should, uh, so the local degree should be one. And of course, we can always find such things. And so T denotes S together with all the primes dividing P. There will be this prime P of interest in the subsequent discussion. G denotes the Galois group, absolute Galois group of F. And G sub T, that denotes uh, the T ramified Galois group. So F sub T is the maximal extension of F when ramified outside, okay, I guess, uh, outside T. And so then GT is that is the corresponding the lower group. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, so this this here should be an F. Yeah, thank you. And uh, so that script X is a smooth curve over these these integers over R, with a good compactification. So meaning it has a, a tall compactification divisor. So. Uh, you know, S itself might be compact in the subsequent discussion. Yeah. But in that case, we assume it's higher genus. That is to say, the next line says that the generic fiber we assume to be hyperbolic. So it's either P1 minus at least three points, genus one minus one point, or higher genus. And then we fix a base point, an integral base point. And here, I'm allowing it to be tangential. I won't explain that what that is. You can just think about it as a usual base point. No, but uh, just for my own comfort, I've put that possibility in because that will occur in some of the applications. Okay, so that's kind of the basic notation. Slightly more complicated <laughs> notation <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> right. So U denotes the QP pro unipotent tau fundamental group of X. So X or X bar. X bar is X considered as a curve over Q bar. And what this U is, there are many descriptions of it, none of them terribly good, but I'll give one uh, possibility. So what you do is you consider all representations of pi into some GLN of V 
where this is a QP vector space. And so assume that, and consider all representations that are unipotent. So what this means is that we can filter V into sub-representations, say Vn, Vn minus one, and so on, up to V0, such that Vi mod Vi minus one is just a trivial representation. So that's what a unipotent representation is, a repeated extension of trivial representations. You consider all such unipotent representations, and for any such thing, so consider a Zariski closure of the image. Of the image of rho. So then that will be some subgroup of GLN of QP, right? And then you consider the inverse limit of all such things <laughs> with the representation. So that's one way of defining what this thing is. There are other definitions, some of them more concrete than others, but I'll just stick with that one for now. Right. So that's what U is. And um, so if you define it that way, so it clearly becomes a pro-unipotent group simply because you're taking these closures inside unipotent representations. So it has a lower central series with the, uh, a, a very, well, in, informative lower central series with corresponding quotients. So U superscript I am denoting by the lower central series. U1 and U2 will be the commutator and then commutator of the commutator. Uh, U bracket, 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 and so on. Yeah, so the lower central series. And U subscript I will be the corresponding quotients. U mod UI plus one. So if you do this, so U is a pro-unipotent group and the subscript U sub I is a, a usual unipotent group. So that's an algebraic group. And so this is one of the many different notions of algebraic fundamental groups associated to a space. And this is a particular, the unipotent completion is a particularly simple version. I don't know if I'll need this for the talk today, but I'll also use to put a U with a superscript and a subscript. U superscript I subscript J for uh, these associated graded pieces for the descending central series in that obvious fashion. Right. Now, I need to also explain this U Duram. That's a so-called unipotent Duram fundamental group. And this, there's no easy way to explain this. But I'll make one brief attempt. So the idea here is instead of this situation, we consider on X considered as a variety over QP now. Remember that this P is the same P that we fixed at the beginning, the rational prime. Right? And over here, you consider the, uh, the unipotent vector bundles with connections. Flat vector bundles with connection. And all I'll say, maybe I'll just describe it in this way, U Duram is a pro-unipotent algebraic group over QP that classifies those vector bundles with connection. So that's one, one way of defining it. It's a fundamental group whose representations correspond to these unipotent vector bundles with connection. Right. Now Px denotes the corresponding torsor of path that is, if U is a fundamental group based at B, then Px denotes the corresponding homotopy classes of paths from B to X. So there are various ways to define this as well. So one way of doing it, I've sort of indicated it here, is that if you consider, say, for um, the, the original U, the QP unipotent tau fundamental group, so what we do is we consider, so this will, just by definition, there's a map from the usual fundamental group to U. So if you consider the, the usual path from B to X, then this is a principal homogeneous space for X with space at B, just by composing a path with a loop at the beginning. So this becomes a principal homogeneous space. So then you just push that out with respect to this morphism. So that's what this PX is. So this will be thought of as the unipotent path from B to X. 
And one way of thinking about those, if you would like to do it, is that you consider locally constant sheaves with QP coefficients and consider the way paths will act as by parallel transport from the fiber V to fiber X. Consider all such parallel transport operators, the risky closure of the image of those, and then the inverse limits of that as you run over locally constant sheaves. That's what PX is. And P to RAM, you do a similar kind of torsos of path construction with the drum fundamental group with bundles with connections instead of locally constant sheaves. Okay, so that's a crash course in, the, in these various unipotent completions. And these form different components of what Deline called the motivic fundamental group of a variety over Q or, or over F. Right. Actually, yeah, sorry. So in, in the current discussion, this should have been F sub V, not Q sub P, although they were the same. Yeah, this is, uh, X started over a number of fields left, so this is X considered over one of its completion, like F sub B, but that was assumed to be the same as QP anyways. Okay, so these are the basic objects of interest, and as I said, I realized that this notation was set up in a very hurried way, so if you have any questions now, you should ask. Otherwise, I'll assume that everybody understood everything and move on. <laughs> no questions? No. no. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> so I'll move forward at your risk then. Okay. So this is a diagram you know, that I've been studying for quite a few years now. And uh, so I called it the diagram of unipotent descent. So what it does, it starts from a point on the curve yeah, and associates to it this torsor of paths that I mentioned a moment ago. So there's a fixed base point. Then for any other point x, okay, so maybe I'll write it again here. So essentially, we're associating to any other point x the torsor of path from b to x yeah, for different theories of the fundamental group. Uh, so b is fixed, and then x is variable over the curve. So in this way, we can view points on the curve as giving rise to torsors for pi 1. Yeah. But then, what this h1 here is, so its construction is a little bit technical, so I won't go into it. But what it is, it's a classifying space for these torsos. You can construct a classifying space for torsos of paths. The G refers to the fact that when, you, when B and X are both rational planes, these unipotent fundamental groups all admit an action of the Galois group of F bar over F. So these all, these, the, this is, follows from the theory, et al. theory of the fundamental group that the, there's a distinction between arbitrary points and rational points and that these things admit natural actions of the Galois group. So then, of course, it also acts on the fundamental group itself. And these actions are all compatible. The way this acts on here, the way it acts on here, and the way this group acts on this homogeneous space, these are all compatible. So what you do is you take spaces of this sort, endowed with this compatible action of pi 1 and the Galois group, and classify them. And that's what this H1 is. It's a classifying space for these torsos. Now, except for the fact that there are some conditions denoted by the subscript F in the cohomology. H1 without any subscript would just denote the classifying space. F refers to the fact that the geometry of the situation puts natural constraints on our principal homogeneous spaces. So these are principal bundles in that topology, so maybe I'll just refer to them that way. So it's a classifying space for principal bundles, but these principal bundles all satisfy natural conditions. Namely, if you look at this Galois group, the action of this guy actually factors through the action of this restricted ramification Galois group. That's the most one, one restriction. That just comes from the fact that this curve and all the base points and so forth have good reduction outside of T. So that, in fact, they are all unramified torsors. So in terms of principal bundles, there are principal bundles on spec F, but they actually to extend to principal bundles on spec R. So that's one restriction that's contained inside 
that H1 subscript F. And the other, which is rather important, is that it satisfies a condition at P called crystalline. These are crystalline torsors. So that's a condition coming from p i d h o t s theory, which um, I, I, that also is too technical to go into right now. But it refers to the fact that if you restrict this action to the action, so there's a subgroup here of the Galois group of f p f v bar over f. So if you restrict the action to this Galois group, it satisfies a condition that's analogous to the unramified condition you know, at the other primes. And that's a crystalline condition. So this H1 sub F, again, classifies all the principal bundles for U with compatible action of the Galois group that satisfies unramifiedness at all primes outside T, but then are also crystalline at all the primes dividing P. And this is with this classifying space. So then the classifying space also work o- over these um, descending central series so that you get one for each one of these series. So that's what this tower is. And as I said, it associates, so these are classifying spaces, so it associates to any given point the torso of pass from B to that point. The, the map at the bottom, I should remark, is a very classical one. The map at the bottom actually is just the one that starts from a point on the curve and goes to a point on the Jacobian of the curve. And then for the Jacobian of the curve, there's a Kummer theory map that goes to the Galois cohomology of G with coefficient in the QP Tate module of the curve. So, so this is the map at the very bottom, which and this space itself can be identified with U1, the lowest level of billion quotient of this, of this unipotent fundamental group. So this map, the bottom map, is a very classical one, and it's just classical Kummer theory. Like this. So if you think about this H1 as being an et al. realization of the Jacobian, yeah, then this is just a usual Abel-Jacobi map, and you can think about all of these things as non-abelian refinements of the Abel-Jacobi map. And since the study of this map at the bottom is sometimes thought of as descent, so we can think of this whole thing as describing some procedure of unipotent descent that gets more and more refined as you go up the tower. So I've been trying to use this tower to study points on a curve. I mean, you can set up, by the way, this machinery for other varieties as well, but I felt like I should first understand what's going on for curves, and that seems to be hard enough. What does, how does one study this, by the way? So I'll tell you, I, want, I don't want to dwell on it too much, but I'm going to give you a brief outline of the basic technical ingredient. It's the fact that you can do this locally at V as well. Remember, V was that prime dividing P. Hmm? And so you do, just look at this class, you set up the same kind of classifying space for the local Galois action. Yeah. And then there's also a map of t e r s e s coming from the local points of the curve. So t h e r e you get a commutative square shown over there, where the lower horizontal arrow is just restriction of cohomology, of non-abelian cohomology. But the point is that then if you look at this locally at P, then this map actually can be computed. This global map is very difficult. So, and, but this map can be computed simply because there's an explicit description of this local classifying space using the drum fundamental group. This is what comes from Pierre de c o g e theory. And this, this space here is just a homogeneous space for an algebraic group, so it has a very explicit description. And this map, furthermore, has an explicit description in terms of Pierre de multiple polylogarithms. So in fact, this, every, this triangle on the right-hand side ends up being very explicit. So uh, that's, that's what we're going to try to use to study this map, this local version over here. And meanwhile, I think I've often emphasized the fact that this upper horizontal arrow is a very difficult thing to understand because normally, given a curve, we don't understand what the, how we can't find the global points. So this is quite difficult. But this map at the bottom ends up actually being a map of algebraic varieties over QP. So in some sense, this should be more manageable than including global points into local points. So that's the idea here. Now, as I said, this is just a general description 
of what this space looks like. Uh, this isomorphism comes again from non-abelian pierre Hodge theory, and this F denotes a Hodge filtration on this fundamental group that comes. That's part of the Hodge theory. Okay. Um, right. Now, so here I'm just essentially uh, re re-describing what I just said. <laughs> I'm so disorganized, I forgot what I wrote on the slide. <laughs> but anyways, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is essentially what I said, except uh, now the map from this classic homological classifying space to this Hodge theoretic one is, uh, this is where the hard Hodge non-abelian Hodge theory lies. It associates to a torsa, a principal bundle for the for a Galois equivariant principal bundle for the tal fundamental group, a principal bundle for the Ram fundamental group via this non-abelian version of Fontaine's construction. Right. Yeah, so as I said then, in, in the previous slide, what we really want to understand is this map, yeah? and we want to find these points <laughs> in some way, and give as explicit description as possible to the global points of a curve, and we're trying to do that by studying this map instead, which I'll emphasize yet again because I forgot to say this clearly enough the first time around, although I mumbled it the second time. This is an algebraic variety over QP, each of these. And this is a map, everything on the uh, lower row is a map of algebraic varieties. So we want to control that. Right, and there's some hope of doing it at least. So, and, um, so the point of doing this I think I've explained in different forms, different ways over the years. So I'll just give one version of it today. And is that the, the way, one of the ways I like to think about the goal of this business is to develop the arithmetic theory of curves in a very uniform way. That's one way of thinking about it. So what do I mean? What I mean is that studying this kind of diagram you know, is a very common thing in the case of elliptic curves. This is the main machinery for studying points on elliptic curves. Except there, for elliptic curves, these UNs are all abelian. There's just one U all the way at the bottom. There's no higher U because the fundamental group is abelian. So there's only an abelian H1, which occurs in the theory of descent for elliptic curves and plays a role in the Birch and Singleton dire conjectures relating points to L functions. And that machinery can, in principle, be extended to curves of higher genus. Except, you have to replace abelian cohomology by this non-abelian cohomology and non-abelian localization. So, as I said, one way of saying this is that we want to make the arithmetic theory of curves in entirely uniform fashion for in any genus. No? Just by replacing abelian cohomology by non-abelian cohomology. Okay, so I think that's a very basic introductory portion. So any questions at this point? Yeah. Again, everybody understood everything. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, now, so let me just uh, give a, a brief description of what's been done so far. So there's a very easy statement. So for example, uh, there's a very easy approach that doesn't work all the time, but it works some of the time, to proving finiteness of points on hyperbolic curves. And the easy statement is what's written up there. Whenever the image of the localization map is not Zariski dense, then there are only finitely many points. That's an easy, con finiteness of points is an easy consequence of this non-denseness. Uh, I, I'm afraid I have to skip back to the previous slide once again. So if you look at this map here, so as I said, it's a map of algebraic varieties. And whenever the image of this map is not a dense, a risky dense subvariety, then you get finiteness of these points. So that's a theorem. Now, why is that? You do this, that's an easy theorem, as I said. And the reason is that you study the intersection between this image and this image. And the, the, this XR, in some sense, is in the intersection of the two things. 
Uh, actually, so I might remark that if you take P large enough, actually, th this map is also injective, although that's not an essential part of the argument. It makes the logic clearer, so I'll, I'll say it. This map is also injective, so everything, all these guys can be regarded as subspaces of this local classifying space. So then, but then the global points lie inside the intersection between the image of the global classifying space and the local points. But the fact that I'm not stating here even formally, and therefore not terribly clearly, is that the image of this map actually is Zersky dense, always. This actually is an analytic, the image is a Zersky dense analytic curve. So then what happens is that if the image of this guy is not the risky dense, then the intersection has to be discrete. There's no choice. Because otherwise, <laughs> if this is a curve, if the intersection would be non-discrete, it would be contained inside the image of this thing. And it couldn't be the risky dense. So the intersection has to be discrete and compact, so it's finite. So that's the argument. So as soon, because this one is very dense, as soon as this one is not dense, and this one is a dense curve, the intersection has to be finite. So that's the argument. So that's a just general fact. But to get this to work and yield actual finiteness seems is still quite hard because proving the non-denseness of the image of the global classifying space is quite hard. But one needs to understand Galois cohomology very well. So in a sense, uh, so Shuji was saying earlier that the tau cohomology is something well understood compared to motivic cohomology. I don't quite agree because <laughs> whenever you're working with a tau cohomology of number field, it's very hard. I mean, anything but very trivial coefficients, we know very little about. And that's, that's the difficulty here as well. So, uh, well, you can do this. You can prove the finest. So I, maybe I won't go over this very quick, very carefully. I'll just say very quickly. If the image of the Galois action on the homology, the tau homology of the curve is essentially abelian, that is, it's an abelian up to a finite index subgroup, in that case, you can prove all this. And you can prove finiteness. So curves having CM Jacobian, for example, will satisfy this hypothesis. So then finiteness will just follow from this approach. But, and the, the way you do this is you use fairly elementary, non, elementary abelian Iwasawa theory, multivariable Iwasawa theory, to control Euler characteristics and so on, or control H2 more precisely. And using that, you can show that in this, pre, in this map, the space, this space has lower dimension than this space for n large in the, in this, in the case of this abelian, essentially abelian Galois image. But otherwise, uh, it's not clear how to use this method. Right. Now, so here I'll entertain you with a little bit of speculation. Um, this method of controlling the dimension seems to be very limited. So instead, what I've been thinking about is to try to formulate some version of duality theory for non-abelian Galois cohomology. So this is a very fanciful notion. What could it possibly mean? Yeah. And I don't know myself either. But, uh, I'll give you an example anyway in a second. But the point is that somehow, so for example, for local non-abelian Galois cohomology, you would like to describe, so this, as I said, the non-abelian cohomology isn't a group, but we have given it the structure of an algebraic variety. So you'd like to describe algebraic functions on this H1 in some cohomological way. So that's what happens for abelian duality. So you have pairing between H1 of a vector, vector group and H1 of, of a dual. And so here, it's non-abelian cohomology, so there's no simple-minded pairing. But I, I still feel like there should be a way of giving a cohomological description of algebraic functions on this variety in a manner that the global classes annihilate each other. So this is kind of a dream, but anyways. So here's an example. <laughs> so I've described this many times as well, but um, I'll go over it very briefly. So here's one case where one can do something like this. So you'd start with an elliptic curve over Q, and take, assume that it has model bay rank one, 
Uh, actually, I can leave out that integral J invariant. That's not necessary. Somehow this is from an old slide. I, I, I said, I'm being very environmentally friendly with my slides and recycling them. But, uh, so you can leave that out. And so you look at this. You also assume that the P part of the Tejshoff-Revich group is finite for some prime of good reduction. And now this next part is also should be unnecessary, but it's slightly, to make the formulas come out neatly, I need to do this at the moment. We'll assume that all the local Tamagawa factors of E are trivial. You can find examples of these curves if you go through Cremona's table <laughs> and, and, start, start, and, and start searching. It's not such a rare thing anyways. And uh, of course, the thing that's hard is this, this, the, to check this kind of thing, of course, you need all these Kolivagin's theorems. But anyways, but now they're all available, so we can come up with plenty of examples of these curves. Now, we want a hyperbolic curve, so you remove the origin, right? So then you get this affine curve you know, in the usual form. We're not considering the project compactification now, but the actual affine curve. And so you might try to study, therefore, the integral points of this curve. So it will be inside the points of the elliptic curve. Of course, and uh, it's still hard to locate, even in this instance, even in this uh, rank one instance. So now here's a theorem, well, I, well actually a formula. What we do is we define a bunch of analytic functions on the QP points of the curve via integration. I am not going to explain this integration too carefully either. This is piadic integration, something called Coleman integration that uh, uses piadic analysis. But in any case, what you do is you choose these two differential forms on the curve, first kind and second kind, and consider their integral from the base point to Z. Now, the funny thing that happens is that this is a theory of line integrals over the piadics, but the funny thing is that there's no ambiguity, there's no choice of path. It has to do with the fact that in the piadics, there's a canonical path between two points. There's something called a Frobenius invariant path. So there's a well-defined integral from any point to any other point. So there's a, I'm calling this function as a function of this endpoint, a logarithm with respect to alpha, and then we also have a logarithm with respect to beta by integrating beta. Now this thing here is an iterated integral. What this means is that you integrate beta once and then you'll get a function of z. You multiply that function by alpha and integrate again. That's what this is. So I've described it this way here, d of z2 D2 is, is just the function integral of beta, the, the indefinite <laughs> integral of beta times alpha. So this is an iterated integral. So these come up when studying multiple zeta values, but right now we're interested in the functions themselves, not in the values. The values come up in something else. And so the formula is this. So first, you fix one point of infinite order you know, on, the, on x. So you have to assume that there's this integral point of infinite order. So I can't find this before, and somebody has to hand it to me. But if you're given that, then any other point lies inside the zero set of this analytic function. Any other integral point has to lie inside the zero set of this analytic function. So this function, let's ex examine it again. So this is the situated integral function of z. This is the logarithm function by integrating alpha. You take the square of that. And this stuff here is, of course, a constant as far as z is concerned. So it's d2 minus a constant times the square of the log. And so this function has to annihilate all the integral points. So that's, that's what happens in this example. Put it in, if you put this into a symmetric form, what they're saying is that given any two integral points, y and z, you have this symmetric relation. Okay? So this is a, an example of the way you might try to, to annihilate integral points you know, in a manner similar to how you use duality to annihilate points on elliptic curves. Now we're working with a hyperbolic curve. Why do you make this, this, this Sorry? Why do you make this okay, I'll explain it now. Yeah. So here's the point. So I, uh, actually, 
the first, the, the honest first answer is I don't know, but uh, the, then I'll, I'll give an explanation even if I don't know. Okay? Right. So, well, we, the, where does this function come from? That's what, that's what I mean by that. And the function comes from this formula. So nowadays I know how to like, motivate these formulas a little bit better, but I still don't understand it very well, so I'm just going to write it down. So what you do is this. Uh, actually, maybe I should have put this diagram first. I'll just put it. Uh, so, so what's going to happen is this. Uh, maybe it's better to work with this first is that this was our function psi from a moment ago. Yeah? And it's constructed by constructing a function here first yeah? and composing with this map. Yeah? And the way we described psi, we used actually the drum fundamental group implicitly. That was part of the description. But you can't prove the vanishing of integral points on the drum fundamental group. You have to give a cohomological description to prove the vanishing annihilation of integral point. So it's actually this function that, that shows why the integral points are annihilated. And the construction of this function is a kind of duality and explicit reciprocity. Now, why is that? So let me give you the formula for this function. So this function node is defined on the whole classifying space, not just on the points, right? But it's just then evaluated on the points by via uh, um, composition with this torturous pass map. Okay, so uh, I'll go back to the formula. Is this. So for this, <laughs> you need to give a little bit of explicit description of this non-abelian cohomology that I'm not going to do right now. <laughs> but uh, the cocycles here can essentially be described by two coordinates. One co a cocycle with, with values in the usual Tate module and a cocycle with values in QP1. That arises. So this U2 is the first non-abelian level of the fundamental group. So it's a Heisenberg group whose abelian part is the Tate module and it's an extension by QP1. So a cocycle can be described by these two coordinates, except this is a usual cocycle. This is a co-chain whose D is equal to the product of A1 with itself, well, one half anyway. So that's, a, that's, a, that's, what, that's the way you describe H1, non-abelian. Now, given such a class, our function phi is defined as follows. So this is a funny looking formula, so let's, I'll explain it just a bit. Is that, so here, chi p is a psychotomic character and you take the log of it. That means that you end up with a qp valued homomorphism on, it, on gp, which you regard as a one cycle with trivial coefficients. So then you can take the cup product between that and this A2 term. So you then, then get a two co-chain with values in QP1. So that's this term. And now here you take a cup product between A1 and some class B. Now what is, what is this class B? This B is a solution to this equation. You take the cup product between this log of psychotomic character again and A1. This has trivial coefficients. This has coefficients in V. Uh, sorry, I should have written V is the, is the periodic tape model of the elliptic curve. So uh, this again is a, then, uh, is a two co-chain with values in the periodic Tate module. And so dB of that, uh, will get, you'll get a one co-chain, B. You solve it this way, and then you plug it into here. So then you get, again get a two co-chain with values in wedge product of V with itself, which is QP1. So this is also a two co-chain uh, with values in QP1. And so, but now separately, they're not co-cycles. Well, when you add them, they end up being a co-cycle. Why can you solve it? That's a good question. So for one thing, locally you can solve it easily because H2 of V is zero locally. Ah. But actually we need more than that. I didn't say write it here, but actually you need to find a global solution to this thing and restrict it. And for that, you need the fact that H2 of the elliptic curve is globally zero as well. And for this, we need the rank, rank one assumption together with the fact that the tatio Fervich group is zero. So this is actually quite non-trivial. <laughs> I wanted to thank you very much for the question. I, to, I said it very quickly. But once you find the global solution and restrict it to the local Galois group, the point is this construction, although it doesn't look like it, doesn't depend on the choice of V. It's independent of the choice of V. And it gives you, the sum gives you a co-cycle co with values in QP1. And now we're local, so then we just identify it with numbers. Mm -hmm. 
No, it does, this doesn't quite exist in the abelian case. The analog of this in the abelian case would just be a cup product somehow. Ah, <laughs> Not quite, no. It's a, it's a, so what it is, it's, it's, it's a version, it's a refined version of what people call a massy product in rational homotopy theory. So it's a higher, higher cohomological product. So that's not so evident, actually, I wrote it this way. So it's a slightly refined version of a product that occurs in, in rational homotopy theory where you're taking the product, a triple product, massy triple product of log of the psychotomic character and A1 and A1 is a triple product. And you have to check that in our context it doesn't depend on various choices, but it doesn't, and you get this way a function. Ah, you have to take U n in general, but U two is enough because of this rank one assumption again. So it'll be enough to consider U two in our setting. If you're at higher rank, you would have to go up higher level. Yeah, and the whole, the whole construction would be tricky. Yeah. But this is just the simplest non-abelian case. So rank one case, remember, so if it's rank zero, of course, you can annihilate the rational functions with just an abelian <coughs> integral. Yeah. So you don't need to go even up to U2. No, because rank one, we can't just annihilate it with an abelian integral. Potentially, the rational, fun well, the rational functions are infinite. Yeah. So we have to uh, pick out the integral points somehow. Yeah. And for that, because in the rank one case, U2 is enough. But in the higher rank case, you'd have to go up higher. Yeah. Right. Ah, uh, so, so, so let me put, let me answer it in this way as a, as a classical Diophantine geometer. Yeah? Where in any case, we're always interested in integral points. It's just a question of projective or non-projective. <laughs> so, so I'm just saying that we're inter studying integral points on the affine curve as opposed to the projective curve. And so, eventually, of course, we want to do this for higher genus curves as well. Oh, it won't be. It can't be, actually. It can't be. Yeah. In, in fact, we can, I can also show you, I don't have it with me now, I can show you computations where it doesn't vanish on rational points. It only vanishes on integral points. And it can't be otherwise because this function here, it has only finitely many zeros. That's right. So the finiteness of points is part, is part of this picture because this is a, so I, I, I can't show you the formulas right now, but this is a periodic analytic function that on every residue disk has a non-zero convergent power series expansion. So it can only have finitely many zeros. So in fact, the finiteness of integral points is a corollary of this statement. Right. And it's quite interesting actually to do the computation and work it out and see that this is constant on integral points and it's not constant on rational points. <coughs> okay, so anyway, so that's the definition of the function phi. Yeah? So, and then, um, so the, the, what, where you get annihilation of integral points, and this is why I called that it's a kind of reciprocity law and a duality, is because okay, so there's two facts. The maps from the integral points to this classifying space actually is concentrated only at P. If you look at the localization at all L not equal to P, it's zero anyway. So this is a local computation that you need to do using the fact that you're taking P, QP coefficients. But the other fact is that this function that we defined on local cohomology a moment ago, when you evaluate it on global class, it's automatically zero. So that when you move over via Hodge theory to the periodic points of the curve, it has to annihilate the integral points. It's, uh, but this is the key fact, that this function is zero on the global points. And what's the reason for that? The reason is, ah, okay, yeah, sorry, sorry, this is what I just said, or this was the thing I showed you earlier. So there's this function, it's zero over here, so when you take that function, it's zero on the integral points, that's what I just said. But, and, but uh, yeah, the, the reason uh, is, is the, for that, uh, I'll just concentrate and so the, this first line is what I just said, essentially. But the, but the fact that it, it annihilates to that phi annihilates the global cohomology classes is because that if you start with a global cohomology class, you can construct all these classes globally as well. 
I constructed it locally, but you can actually just construct global H2, which restricts to the local thing. And then via your exact sequence, it has to be zero. So that's the thing. So, so cohomologically, I just given a construction of an algebraic function on the local H1 in such a way that the global class is annihilated. Yeah. So somehow, there's something like a duality and a reciprocity for non-abelian cohomology that's going on, except I don't know a general formulation still for what it should look like. It's just an example. Okay, so that's that picture. Any questions here? No, everybody's just understanding beautifully, so we can move on. Yeah. 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 So. Right. But there is something more systematic about duality that I wanted to say. And this occurs when we abandon the non-abelian cohomology and go back to abelian cohomology. Hmm. By looking at the previous classifying spaces, not globally, but just at the tangent space. Hmm. So that's a natural thing to do. So these are classifying spaces. So let's just compute tangent maps for the localization maps. Yeah. And that should already give us a lot of information about the behavior of this map. So that's what I've written here. Oh, oops, sorry. I'm mixing up these two, two, two gadgets. So here, you take some point on this classifying space, consider its tangent space, and the corresponding to it, there will be a tangent space for the local classifying space, and there will be a tangent map for the local localization map at any point. Now, this is fairly easy to study at least at a formal level, because this tangent space can be just computed. So what is the tangent? If you compute the tangent space, what it is, it becomes cohomology again, except it's coefficients in the Lie algebra of you. So this is one of these standard things that you'll see often in the deformation theory of principal bundles, that you get cohomology with coefficients in the Lie algebra of you, except the Galois action is twisted by this co-cycle that you're taking the tangent space at. So that's the only difference. It's a, as C varies, you get cohomology with coefficients in the Lie algebra with a twisted Galois action coming from this C. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so that's 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 the, what the tangent spaces look like, and then the localization map is just a localization for this abelian cohomology. You know, no, this is the usual abelian cohomology. Yeah. And so, um, this uh, viewpoint actually also is fairly common in people who study non-abelian Hodge theory. That when you look at this. Uh, uh, classifying spaces for principal bundles on a Riemann surface and things like that. So there's a non-abelian Hodge theory associated with that. And there are these situations where they like to discuss the fact that moduli space itself has a Hodge structure and when uh, 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 asked to define what that means. So there are many approaches, but Toen and Pantef and people like that, they seem to think that the correct formulation is to say that the tangent spaces are, have Hodge structures that vary in a nice way. So this is a kind of similar construction, except we're studying it in a Galois theoretic setting. So what is, what is the use of this? Well, so for example, if you just want to prove finiteness of points, I pointed out earlier that you want to prove non-denseness of the image, right? So if you just proved that this tangent map was non, not surjective at a generic point, then the, map, then the original map would have non-dense image as well. Yeah? So for that, you need one remark, which I'm, I didn't make earlier. This local classifying space is always smooth. The global space can be more complicated. But the local space is always smooth. So in fact, if you look at the tan if the tangent map is not surjective, then the map uh, uh, on points cannot have dense image. So this is one thing, therefore, that you can try to study to understand the non-abelian cohomology we can linearize. Now, but there's another formulation which comes up often in the theory of elliptic curves that's related to this non-surjectivity. Namely, we look at the dual space. See, locally now, we can look at the cotangent space of this classifying space, which will then be the dual of this Lie algebra va va valued cohomology that I mentioned earlier. But then, local dual Tate's duality now just for this abelian cohomology tells us that this, this cotangent space looks like this. So there's, there's, there'd be a duality between um, this, the Galois cohomology without any conditions, and then the dual space for H1 sub F of L with twist is just H1 mod H1 sub F of the dual space. So this is the standard thing that comes up in this block cutter type theory. So that's the cotangent space of the local classifying space. Right, so then, so here's an easy theorem again. 
related to finiteness. Suppose that there's a global cohomology class hmm, with the property that locally is zero everywhere except at V. Hmm. Ah, sorry, non-zero meaning it's, it's, fair, it's, it's zero everywhere except at V where it, it's, it's not, not just non-zero, it's not inside H1 sub F. In that case, then this localization map has to have non-dense image. So you get finiteness in this situation. So as I said, this is an easy theorem, but it reduces the study of points to a construction of these cohomology classes. Again, which is what happens in the theory of elliptic curves. So what, what this generic means here? Do you have to take mm -hmm. any of them you tell just have to take generic point, but but it's a, oftentimes I care. I don't know the structure of these classifier spaces very well. Most a lot of the in any example that I know they are connected, so you just have to take one generic point. <laughs> so point is, I mean, I would like to be able to say this just at the origin, except the origin may be particularly singular, so I, I, it can't be just formulated at the origin. So I have to take a generic point. But this is, the proof of this is very easy. So actually, I, I, maybe I won't bother you with it. The general idea is what many of you are familiar with from, from elliptic curves. Prototate duality tells us that global classes on this side and global classes on the other side annihilate each other. Yeah? But then uh, locally, well, we've set things up in such a way that if we take an element in here, then this class is zero everywhere at V except at V, so the global pairing just becomes this local pairing at V. And then for any A that comes from a global cohomology class, it's annihilated by the prototate uh, theorem, but, but since it defines by definition, by a construct, that our, our condition, it defines a non-linear, non-trivial linear functional, then the tangent, tangential localization map we mentioned earlier can't be surjective, so that's the reason for this. So as I said, if you just assume this kind of existence of this cohomology class, which for elliptic curves you might construct out of Euler systems or something like this, that then, then you get vanishing of uh, this non-denseness of image and hence finiteness of points. Yeah, so this is another aspect of how you might try to make the arithmetic of curves uniform in some way. Right, so that's an easy thing. So let me give you an example of one trivial situation where we can make this work. I mean, it's, 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 it's obviously a hopeless strategy, yeah? in some ways, at least. Uh, constructing these cohomology classes is a famously hard problem at the moment, yeah, where people do go through all kinds of arithmetic rigmarole in order to get at them, right? And so it's trying to reduce this unknown theorem to a very difficult unknown fact. Uh, um, in that sense, there's not much justification for it, but I'm still studying it now. Um, so one example, anyways, where this does work is, oh, sorry, I still had to explain one more thing, yeah, right? But maybe uh, I'll go through this part quickly because it's, I'm not really giving you a clear sense of the proof anyway. You can do this whole duality theory, by the way, in families. As we vary over the points of the classifying space, that's what I mean by this duality in families. Yeah? So this, uh, if you, the various tangent spaces and cotangent spaces will be sheaves on this classifying space for principal bundles. And then the duality also occurs inside families as you go over the different points of the classifying space. And so that's what I mean. That's what that's what's described in these few slides. So that somehow this in other words, this H one with coefficients in L twisted by C, it's a good idea to see how it varies with C, with the cocycle that you're twisting. And sometimes you can prove that it forms a vector bundle. It's it's it, it, that also depends on com con controlling cohomology. So I can't do it in too much generality, but sometimes you can do it. So that's what's described here. So I'll skip all that. Yeah, and then I'll just mention that you can make this idea work. So, for example, just for pure minus three points. Yeah? Except, you could, um, so uh, long ago, 
I gave this proof of Siegel theorem for p minus three points over Q, but you can, by using this duality idea, you can prove it for totally real fields, for example. So how do you do this? So I tried to give a rough sketch of how it works. In this case, this unipotent complete, uh, fundamental group is freely generated by two elements. The two elements that generate homology, you lift it to the fundamental group, and then the, the gen they generate all of you. And now if you choose a tangential base point, you can make one of these generate as invariant under the Galois group and make it act by the psychotomic character. Then the other one will be acted on in a complicated way, but we don't have to care too much about that for the moment. Now, inside the Lie algebra of you, you can look at the IDO generated by the monomials, Lie monomials in the two generators, E and F, where that have degree at least two in F. Then that forms an ideal because of this fact. You can take the quotient. So in other words, what I'm doing here is, so in general, when you're trying to use, apply these unipotent fundamental groups, it's a good idea to vary depending on the situation. Go to various quotients, for example, that can simplify your analysis. Sometimes it's good not to go to quotients. It's good to use a big group depending on uh, what you want to do with the map, with this map from the points that is. But sometimes it's good to go to quotient, and I'm showing you one way of the constructing a quotient, a canonical quotient that simplifies the analysis considerably. So in this case, you get a quotient modulo an ideal generated by the Lie monomials that have f degree at least two. So you have to check that there's color invariant, but that follows from this. So then what you get is a fundamental group, a quotient of the fundamental group N. So this is the Lie algebra, and then of course there's the corresponding group, who's at level one is the same as, as you, but in higher levels it's just one dimensional generated by the add of E acting many times on F. So this is the effect of this construction. And furthermore, when you look at the Galois action in degree two and above, at the bottom, so there's a non-trivial extension, but in degree two and above, it just splits into a direct sum of all these things. So this comes up when people study polylogarithms on P1 minus three points, this, this quotient essentially. But now, when you consider, so this is what happens for the tangential base point, when you consider twists of this via co-cycles, as you vary over the fundamental group uh, that I mentioned, over the classifying space that I mentioned earlier, it's still, it can have a more complicated structure in general, but, at the, but in any case, for the tangential base point, this part has a very simple Galois action. So you can do this, use this to construct classes. Okay, so this is a, uh, uh, so you have to do a little bit of preparation. Now, what for, so for example, for any totally real field, well, I guess for this you don't even need it to be totally real. In any case, uh, this H2 with coefficients in QPN is zero, yeah, for N at least two. So this is Sula's vanishing theorem that works for any number of fields. But then, uh, even for the dual, now, the, so this is, uh, here you have negative taste twist, so you don't know anything. <laughs> you don't have too much control. No? Nevertheless, it's still true that for sufficiently large and these H2s are also zero. That's because when you try to compute this cohomology, it will be classified, uh, controlled by an Iwasawa module over some psychotomic ZP extension, and that ideal class group is still torsion for a one, ra for a one variable U.S. Hour algebra. If you use that, then this H2 in any case is zero for fi except for finitely many n. So you don't have complete control, but at least you have some control in these kind of situations. So the a consequence of it is that because of these facts, you can prove that this global cohomology varieties, the classifying spaces are smooth, and then you can control all these, uh, in, uh, these dimensions. So I'm running out of time, so I'll try to wrap up very quickly what's going on. The key point is this, so I'll just put it right here. You know, skip all the way through and uh, try to explain, give you a brief idea. The key point is that, so let's just denote by, so this is a lot of notation, n sub n, k plus, this is the direct sum of the even powers here. Yeah. So if you just take the direct sum of, as i goes from k to n, of the even graded pieces, then what happens is that for a totally real field, inside the global cohomology of the dual module, you can find a subspace of relatively large dimension. That is, the, locally, it's, it looks like this whole thing, but such that is zero 
the localization is zero everywhere but V. And at V, it just becomes local cumulative. It's possible to construct such a thing for totally real fields. So uh, in order to make the rest of the story quite short, so this fact is actually a fairly easy dimension count using the fact that it's totally real. So in this case, you can show that there are plenty of global cohomology classes. And then, as I said, to make a long story short, then starting with this, you deform these classes to nearby twist using, using the fact that various things form vector bundles as you run over the classifying space. And then make the previous strategy come, come through, that there is this global class, which is not in F, only at V. <laughs> no. No. Not there, no, you don't need it there, no. But for it to give you a finiteness of points, you need that. So this is, a, uh, uh, this is a reiterating down the argument that I just mumbled, but the corollary is simply this. That as, uh, for n sufficiently large in our situation, oh, sorry, this m should be n, I just misprint again. For n sufficiently large, this tangential localization map is not surjective for p and minus three points over a totally real field. So that's one fact. And so you get finiteness of points in this kind of situation. So as I said, this is still a very weak situation trying to produce a lot of cohomological machinery to prove a known fact. But uh, I think it, at least, so there's an non-abelian example for the elliptic curves of rank one and then this linearized version that I described just now seem to give some indication that the idea of somehow using duality to control points for hyperbolic curves is maybe not completely empty. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, any question? Okay, I have a question. So you're mm -hmm. Cohomology class you constructed yeah. has some uh, any sort of the uh, motific origins, like uh, you ha it has comes from some kind of or more kind of a motific cohomology or. Uh, you mean like you mean for for the elliptic curve case or the well, or? well any case I mean uh, do your case for example like in this in this p one minus three point yeah, case yeah. that I don't know it's just it's just uh, it's not constructed somehow we, we just know they exist by a dimension yeah 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 yeah, 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 that, yeah but that just, this is not constructed uh, uh, it's not constructed uh, yeah, yeah. and as you know I mean this is a tricky issue uh, yeah. that I'm sure you understand very well this the the point is that uh, these classes in any case you don't want them to be completely motivic. This occurs in the case of elliptic curves as well, and I think this point is somehow some not emphasized enough. It's because you want to use them to annihilate points, meaning you want the, their behavior, local behavior at V to be singular. You don't want them to lie inside H1 of F. So in, in the construction, in Euler system constructions, you start with how with something motivic, and you have to do a bunch of things, either take derivatives or twists or something, and end up with a non-motivic class. And this is a mysterious procedure somehow. No, that, no, no. I mean, you know. if, you, yeah, yeah. if you have some element which is mm -hmm. not integral, I mean, right. well, I mean, then uh, it may give rise some kind That's of... That's true, too, yeah. yeah. Non-integrality may be another way of... I agree, I agree. Yeah. But in any case, you don't want it to be too strongly motivated in any yeah. case. No, but that's not the way these are constructed in any case. Yeah. But, but you have to do something, because as far as I know, so I guess we had that discussion before, but for example, Kata's Euler systems are integral, but then by this, by this twisting and derivatives, yes, he, make yes. them non, he makes them singular at various. So it's a, it's a, there, there are many things that need to be done to produce the right sort of classes. Yeah. So here as well. I right. also have another question. So mm -hmm. If you try to extend this to the ethical case, right. okay, so then, uh, well, do you expect this maybe rank one assumption is very essential? No, that's not essential that's at all. Essential? No, no, you just need to go higher up the tower. Yeah, but, uh, uh -huh. mm -hmm. but in reality, so if you, mm -hmm. ah, I see, so your, your, your construction is not constructive. I mean, it's not constructive, I mean, but, so for example, you can certainly prove finite needs of points on any rank mm -hmm. elliptic curve, uh, minus the origin, that is, of integral points on elliptic curve minus the origin of any rank in the CM case. Somehow you can still show that such classes exist in the CM case when because of the abelian Galois image business that I referred to earlier. 
But whenever you... I showed this in like, if you really try to be constructive, like maybe Rankong assumption is maybe may play some role. It may be. Yeah. You're, 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 of course, you're right. Because I mean, that's that's what the elliptic curve theory <laughs> indicates as well. You're right. No, no. In that sense, you're, of course, yes. For the the um, I, I, I really don't know. The, but I'll, I'll tell you, as a matter of suspicion, I suspect that this story may be easier than the case of elliptic curves. You know? Because, uh, let's say, uh, I mean, so this is hard to explain in brief terms, but if you look at the first proof of finite of points for curves having CM Jacobians, it uses non-vanishing of algebraic L, L functions. And uh, the thing is, but uh, in the region that you're looking at as you go up the fundamental group, the, the relevant L functions are obviously non-vanishing, just for kind of trivial reasons. <laughs> And this, uh, whereas in the elliptic curve case, you always have to worry about whether it's actually vanishing or not. <laughs> so somehow there's not a uniform method that works for elliptic curves. But here, for high edginess or hyperbolic curves, as you go up the tower, I feel like the, I, I've always felt like this should be somehow an easier issue than the genus one case. Any other question? So if not, there's some to speak again. Thank you. Uh, we'll have a group photo yeah, in front of this building, first floor. So let's let us go down here. Yeah.